Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to all you early risers. I'm not a morning person myself, which, uh, which may become all too evident as I uh, attempt to speak to you this morning, but, uh, but I was scheduled for this talk, and here I am. Uh, the talk this morning is about quality assurance and, and the potential for markets and uh, quality assurance, and I'm going to discuss this subject uh, with particular uh, focus on uh, quality assurance with regard to drugs and medical devices, because uh, in uh, this country, we have the Food and Drug Administration, which purports to provide such quality assurance. And uh, so, in a way, this is a talk about how the FDA regulates and goes about its other activities. Uh, but uh, the principles I will be discussing here are widely applicable, and it won't require too much mental effort on your part to carry these principles over to the consideration of quality assurance in other areas of the economy. I think they're quite general, actually. Uh, before I begin my formal presentation, I want to call to your attention a couple of sources because uh, one of them, uh, this article with the rather long and cumbersome title uh, that you see displayed on the screen right now, uh, was uh, published in the, in the Review of Austrian Economics in 1994, and um, I, I don't have any... Uh, anything much to add to it at this point. I haven't changed my mind about anything I said in the article. So uh, it's still good. Uh, it's, uh, perhaps some of the uh, factual references are a little bit out of date, but even then, not much, because the Food and Drug Administration changes the details, but never the basics. So I, I commend this article to you. It, it is uh, my most... Uh, my most uh, careful attempt to present this issue from a strict Austrian economics uh, standpoint. And, uh, and I'm not going to try to go through the way I laid the argument out in, the, in that article this morning. I'm going to uh, discuss the topic a little more informally, but the ideas are the same. Uh, it's just that the formalities of that article are a little more uh, carefully laid out than what I'll do this morning. The, another source I want to uh, make you aware of is a little book that I edited in 1995 called Hazardous to Our Health? Question uh, mark. Subtitled FDA Regulation of Healthcare Products. And this booklet is, it was published by and is still available from the Independent Institute and. Uh, most of it uh, was written by the editor, me, and uh, <laughs> a couple of other chapters were provided uh, uh, by, uh, by Paul Rubin and by uh, Ronald Hansen, and uh, uh, they're nice chapters, and so I, I commend the whole book to you, especially uh, my long chapter here about FDA regulation of medical devices. I spent... Uh, several years in the 1990s making this my principal research topic, so, so I, I learned more than any human being should have to learn about that topic. And, and if you'd like to see some of the details, and believe me, the devil is in the details, uh, then you can find them there. Okay, let's proceed. If you were suffering from a serious disease, would you prefer A, that you and your doctor decide how to treat your ailment, selecting from all existing medical goods the ones that offer the best combination of benefit and risk, or B, that you and your doctor select from all medical goods except those, possibly the most promising ones, that a low-level government employee in Rockville, Maryland, has decided to withhold from you? Tough choice, huh? The answer is obvious. Rational people would never consider themselves better off because their range of choice had been arbitrarily limited. 
Yet such restriction of consumer choice, affecting both patients and their physicians, fetters consumers at all times in the United States. And I might add, in, in many other countries as well, although probably no other country has the severity of regulation in this area that the United States has. The Food and Drug Administration alone decides whether a newly devised medical good, whether a drug or a device, may be sold. Many potentially beneficial goods remain on the shelf for a decade or more, while their manufacturers traverse the rigid and elaborate testing procedures required by the FDA before it will approve marketing. While innovative medical goods run the bureau bureaucratic gauntlet, people who could have benefited from their use suffer and die unnecessarily. Defenders of the government's actions insist that without the FDA's regulations, greater harm would occur. Consumers would suffer from the toxicity or adverse side effects of unsafe products, or they would squander their money on useless remedies. Consumers can avoid these injuries if they are permit permitted to use only medical goods that have met high standards of safety and efficacy by passing successfully through the FDA's required testing. In testimony before a congressional committee, an FDA official said the following. The allegation has been made that the cost to our society to prevent a thalidomide-type tragedy far exceeds the benefits of a regulatory system developed to prevent such a tragedy. We disagree. We believe that benefits which accrue to society because of our regulatory system are worth the cost and far outweigh any risks." End quote. This statement, which expresses the agency's standard line, is remarkable in at least five ways. And let me spell out those ways. First, it uses the most notorious medical tragedy of modern times to illustrate what presumably the FDA's regulation routinely prevents. The presumption is indefensible. Except in a freakishly unlikely case, one may not reasonably assume that an unrestricted manufacturer would sell a medical good giving rise to a, quote, thalidomide-type tragedy. Besides their ethics, manufacturers have good financial reasons, including product liability judgments and loss of consumer confidence, to be careful about what they place on the market. Second, the statement stands alone, without any attempt to demonstrate that the lives saved and the suffering prevented exceed the lives lost and the suffering endured as a result of the FDA's regulation. It is merely a naked, naked declaration, which the audience presumably should accept because it emanates from the self-proclaimed experts. Third, the statement speaks of the benefits and costs of regulation as if they were experienced by society at large rather than by specific individuals who differ enormously in their personal valuation of the costs and benefits and in their willingness to bear risk. It rests upon the unspoken assumption that a single rule should apply in all cases, mocking the actual heterogeneity of people's preferences and medical conditions. Fourth, the statement confidently declares, we disagree and we believe, while describing the balance of benefits and costs experienced by others. But only specific individuals can possibly know whether the benefits to them outweigh the costs to them. Neither the benefits nor the costs can be objectively assessed by third parties, nor may the benefits and costs experienced by many individuals be aggregated into total or social valuations and thereby uh, made comparable. There's no common unit of account in which the aggregation may be made. Who knows how to measure the depth of one person's fear, the breadth of another's relief. Fifth, the statement presumes an answer 
the wrong answer uh, to the question posed by an AIDS activist and FDA critic, Martin Delaney, quote, who should decide which risks are acceptable, the bureaucracy in Washington or the patient whose life is on the line, end quote. Let me speak a little bit now about the, the regulator's incentives. The people who make decisions uh, at the FDA respond to incentives just as people do elsewhere. The bureaucrats prefer to advance in their careers. They do not want their incompetence or blameworthiness to be exposed. In their circumstances, FDA examiners may err in two different ways. Type 1 error, the examiner does not approve a product that is safe and efficacious. Type 2 error, the examiner approves a product that is not safe or efficacious. Naturally, the examiners want to protect themselves from criticism arising from their commission of errors. Their incentives to avoid a mistake, however, differ greatly for the two types of error. A former FDA inspector described the situation this way, quote, anytime you approve a new drug, you're wide open for attack. If the drug turns out to be less effective than the original data showed, they can nail you for selling out to a drug company. If it turns out to be less safe than anybody expected, some congressman or a newspaper writer will get you. There's only one way to play it safe. Turn down the application or at least stall for time and demand more research." End quote. Because of such demands for more research, new drug applications now commonly consist of two or more volumes of summary data and as many as 100 volumes of raw data, sometimes more than 100,000 pages altogether. Some of these applications are delivered in trucks to the FDA headquarters in Rockville. Although such heavyweight requirements help an FDA examiner to, quote, play it safe, they often result in much avoidable suffering and many deaths among the patient population awaiting access to the good. Unfortunately, the news media, members of Congress, and self-described consumer advocates almost never hold the bureaucrats responsible for these invisible or statistical deaths, as they're known. Hence, the cost of a single bureaucrat's career insurance may be, and in some cases surely has been, tremendous sacrifice of human health and life. Let's think a little bit about lives saved and lives lost now. Consider, for example, that from 1963 to 1973, as one source put it, the FDA's doors were essentially closed to cardiovascular drugs. Even though cardiovascular disease was the leading cause of death in the United States and rapid advances were occurring during those years in uh, pharmaceutical therapies, beta blockers, an especially valuable class of drugs, awaited FDA approval for a decade after they were first used abroad. Dr. William Wardell, a professor of pharmacology, toxicology, and medicine at the University of Rochester, uh, estimated that in 1979, a single beta blocker, alprenolol, which had already been sold for three years in the strictly regulated Swedish market, could have saved more than, than 10,000 lives a year in the United States. Well, if this, if this drug took an extra <laughs> 10 years <laughs> waiting to be used, and meanwhile, 10,000 deaths were occurring that might have been prevented by its use, you have a number of deaths there greater than the number of Americans who died in the Korean War and the Vietnam War combined. And very few people even have heard of this. And this is one single drug, one single case. And there are hundreds, thousands even, over the years. Other examples given by Wardell include quote, years of delay in the availability of at least four respiratory drugs, which he names, that caused 
severe disadvantages to many asthma sufferers, as well as a six-year lag in the availability of valproate in particular, and the continued absence of, of uh, nitrazepam that substantially reduced the treatment options for epileptic patients. Lithium carbonate, an effective drug for the treatment of manic depressive disorder, was used in 40 countries before its approval by the FDA. Uh, a 1980 study by the U.S. General Accounting Office examined 14 therapeutically important drugs introduced in the United States between 1975 and 1978, and the analysts found that only one of the 14 had become available first in the United States. For the others, the lag in availability ranged from two months to 13 years. Uh, back when I was doing research on this topic, I encountered a book uh, which consisted entirely of uh, an annotated list of drugs available elsewhere in the world but not in the United States. A book, a whole book with uh, one or two pages required to describe each of the drugs it discussed. Astonishingly, the FDA has given little or no weight to foreign evidence of product safety and efficacy. Nearly all new drugs and devices have been forced to pass through the same rigid, expensive, and time-consuming testing procedures in the United States, even though a product might already have been used successfully for years elsewhere. Economists Henry Grabowski and John Vernon of Duke University made many studies of the pharmaceutical industry. Considering the results of their own research, along with the findings of other studies comparing the experience of various countries, they concluded that, quote, U.S. citizens have experienced sizable foregone health benefits from regulatory-induced delays in obtaining beneficial new drugs while obtaining relatively modest benefits in the form of less exposure to drug toxicity. Perhaps the most damaging consequence of the FDA's regulation since 1962, when the law was changed and made much more severe, uh, when the testing requirements were made more elaborate and time-consuming, is the slowdown in the rate of innovation. In view of the high costs of securing FDA approval to market new products, many manufacturers conclude that otherwise promising R&D projects will not be profitable. As a result, beneficial new drugs and devices are never created. Suffering and death that might have been prevented continue unabated. Of course, since the innovations never come into existence, hardly anyone appreciates that uh, they have sacrificed themselves on the altar of regulation. It's worthwhile considering how the activity of the FDA is violently inconsistent with the rule of law. The rule of law means much more than the requirements that the legislature authorize an exercise of power by the executive branch of government. Classical liberals understand the rule of law as requiring that the law be clear and understandable, that penalties for violation be predictable, and that the law be applied equally to everyone, including members of the government. The FDA's actions, though broadly sanctioned by legislation, fail to satisfy these criteria. In stark violation of a genuine rule of law, the FDA's actions are frequently arbitrary and capricious, sometimes even blatantly unconstitutional, as when they restrict freedom of speech and the press by their re restrictions on advertising of products. In the medical device industry, where the FDA conducted a jihad during the early 1990s, manufacturers remonstrated that their cited violations of the agency's good manufacturing practice, as they're called, GMP, Regulations often arise because the regulations are vague. Uh, one source says, even companies that genuinely try to comply fully with U.S. GMPs can find themselves cited for violations. Companies whose products are esteemed by customers have been forced to stop production because their paperwork did not satisfy the regulators. And in fact, G GMP regulations are almost entirely uh, in relation to, to paperwork. Uh, 
there's a mass of reports that the FDA requires, and, and any tiny deviation from compliance uh, may result in, in uh, actual closure of a production line. The Health Industry Manufacturers Association complained that the FDA, quote, has not made clear the type of data it wants to see. Uh, therefore, companies must make a series of information submissions, hoping that something will satisfy the regulators. Sometimes the FDA requests one type of study, then changes its requirement and requests another type after the company has completed the first one. Uh, Health Industry Manufacturers Association Director Alan Magazine d described the de device approval process as, quote, a giant guessing game. Supplicants can expect no reliable guidance by asking the FDA what is required. Uh, in fact, I know of many cases where the FDA refused to speak to companies calling on the phone to ask questions. The agency does not respond to inquiries expeditiously. When it does respond, the response often lacks substance. Moreover, after years of countermanding the informal advice given to regulated parties, it announced in 1992 that it would no longer be bound by its own formal advice. Indeed, the head of FDA drug surveillance stated, quote, we used to say that if a company made certain changes, then we would probably not take any action. Now we won't. Now, even if they make the changes, they might end up in court. We want to say to these companies that you don't know when or how we'll strike. We want to eliminate predictability. Ponder that statement. Land of the free. We want to eliminate predictability in punishing you citizens. That a civil servant, so-called, would make such a statement is stunning. Recourse to the courts, which is costly, time-consuming, and full of uncertainty, holds little promise of protection in view of what Wardell has called the extreme vulnerability of the industrial firm that argues with the FDA. Without a search warrant, the FDA may inspect a company's plant and records at any time. Because the regulations are so numerous and so often vague, uh, if you go look, for example, in the Code of Federal Regulations, you'll find that, uh, well, the last time I looked, at least, uh, uh, there were eight volumes in the Code of Federal Regulation uh, listing the federal law that at that time was in force with regard to FDA regulation. Uh, give, given the large volume of, of legal and regulatory stipulations in the law, re inspectors can always find violations if they want to. In short, the agency possesses the power to destroy a company at will, to retaliate for past uh, resistance, or to make an example by closing down the firm's operations or seizing its property. So much for the genuine rule of law. Let me say a little bit about paternalism. There is a place for paternalism. It is in the family, where young children are incapable of making wise decisions for themselves, and where a parent linked to the children by bonds of love and responsibility may normally be relied upon to decide what is best for them. But when paternalism becomes a form of government, when the individual freedom and responsibility of competent adult citizens are suppressed in favor of exclusive decision-making by a central planning board, no one should expect a healthy outcome. For more than a century, Americans have been forbidden to make important decisions regarding their own health, decisions on which each individual's life and health depend. Of course, we've been assured by those who wield the power that they act only in our best interest. But anyone who makes even a superficial study of the FDA, its regulations, and congressional overseers quickly discovers that the official line is far from the truth. This government agency, like all of the others, is a political 
institution, swayed by the ceaseless quest of its leaders for position, publicity, power, privilege, and perquisites, all associated with a big budget and a far-reaching agenda. It is a mistake to suppose that the FDA, FDA acts or even attempts to act so that all things considered, suffering and loss of life are minimized. Instead, responding to the asymmetrical incentives created by the reactions of the news media, certain members of Congress, and so-called consumer advocates, the FDA officials systematically strive to avoid type 2 errors while disregarding type 1 errors. Not relishing the negative publicity sure to follow their approval of medical goods that later cause harm, even slight harm, they adopt the rule of obstructionists, requiring ever more stringent, expensive, and time-consuming testing before allowing goods to reach the market. That avoidable suffering and death routinely occur while they drag their feet and protect their careers does not sway them, because hardly anyone holds them accountable for the harm caused by their type 1 errors. And I might say this whole business of the relative magnitude of type 1 and type 2 errors at the FDA has been studied by scores of economists, and I know not a single study that concluded anything different from mine about the balance of type 1 and type 2 errors at the FDA. It's obvious which way the balance goes. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit and come at uh, these uh, matters from a slightly different angle. Let's think about risk. Risk attends the use of medical goods, drugs and devices, wh whether used for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. The consumer may suffer directly because of adverse side effects or indirectly by using a particular good instead of a more beneficial alternative. Mainstream economists commonly attribute the, quote, excessive harm to imperfect consumer information, and they characterize the conditions giving rise to such harm as market failures. These economists conclude that government provision of information and government regulation of the terms on which medical goods may be sold or used can remedy the failure and produce a more efficient allocation of resources. This way of thinking about the issue is incomplete and seriously misleading. In fact, two kinds of risk exist. There is, to be sure, a risk of harm from using the good. But there is also a risk that, denied access to the good, consumers will be harmed because alternative medical goods are less effective in curing or ameliorating their condition. I'll call the first kind of risk use risk, and the second kind of risk prohibition risk. Obviously, the two vary in reciprocal relation. The more the government diminishes people's exposure to use risk by limiting a good's availability, the more it exposes them to prohibition risk, and vice versa. Notwithstanding the common characterization of the problem as one of imperfect consumer information, the underlying risks cannot be banished by decree. They are inherent in the state of scientific knowledge and technical skill. The vital issue is how to optimize exposure to the two kinds of risks, balancing them to maximize the welfare of consumers. My concern now in the discussion is to analyze how the allocation takes place under government regulation of the kind carried out by the FDA, and to contrast the system with the allocation under an unimpeded market process. My general conclusion is that the market brings forth a superior outcome, especially in the long run. It's instructive to consider the issue along the lines pioneered by Mises and Hayek and developed further by their Austrian school followers in the analysis of central planning. From this analysis, we know that socialism cannot succeed if by success one means the attainment of maximum 
feasible satisfaction of consumers' wants. Information about resource endowments, technical constraints, and consumer preferences is dispersed among the population. Moreover, this information is always in flux. Central planners have no effective means of collecting the relevant information. Even if somehow they could collect the information, it would be obsolete by the time they implemented plans based on it. Ever-changing consumer preferences cannot conceivably be known by central planners. The consumers themselves do not know exactly what their preferences are until the moment they act on them. They have demonstrated preferences, notwithstanding the usual assumption of neoclassical economics, they do not have a stable, all-encompassing indifference map in their minds. It would be pointless for a government to conduct a survey to discover people's preferences. Opinions are one thing, and demonstrated preferences, which the consumers ne necessarily bear real opportunity costs known only to them, are something else. And they are the only preferences that count in the maximization of consumer welfare. This kind of analysis can also be applied in considering the allocation of risks with medical goods. Only individual consumers who are free to seek whatever professional advice or other information they consider worthwhile can evaluate the risk of using a medical good and the risk of not using it and can determine the point at which weighing the two kinds of risk in their own judgment, they find the use of one uh, the use risk to be acceptable. Consumers alone are in a position to compare the prospective pains and pleasures inherent in the decision and to determine when the risk of not using a good outweighs the risk of using it. Others have no way to intuit or simulate judgments of this kind. Let me repeat, others have no way. You cannot get into another person's mind. And only that mind can make these judgments. Only risk bearers themselves know the scale of values on which the opposing risks are weighed, the units in which the prospective disutilities of risk bearing are measured. If outsiders presume to make the decision for those who actually bear the risk, the intervention represents nothing more than the pretense of knowledge for which Hayek indicted the central planners macroeconomists, and neoclassical welfare economists. The intervention compounds ignorance of consumers' true preferences with government coercion. To believe that such heavy-handedness can improve the welfare of consumers is sheer paternalism and bad economics. Let's look at how the regulation actually works. Apart from the fundamental incapacity of government regulators to solve the relevant allocation problem, it is folly to think that they would do so even if they could. Public choice theory and careful observation alike teach us that regulators tend to seek their own interests rather than the public interests. To preserve their budgets and their prerogatives, they respond to the dictates of their political overseers elected politicians who seek re-election and self-aggrandizement and do not shrink from twisting the truth and burdening the public in that quest. Knowing that the polity responds disproportionately to crises, politicians and bureaucrats exploit notorious events such as the elixir sulfonilamide tragedy of 1937 and the thalidomide affair of 1962 to justify great ex extensions of their authority. As a rule, they employ their powers with heavy emphasis on the short term, readily sacrificing longer run and widely dispersed benefits for immediate, concentrated, and often specious benefits for which political credit can be claimed. In making decisions that allocate risk and prohibition risk, regulators systematically disregard the use risk and, and excuse me, regard the use risk and disregard the prohibition risk. This imbalance makes good sense to them regardless of its unfortunate consequence for the consumers. If adverse side effects cause serious or 
a widespread harm when consumers use a government-approved good, those who approved it will be held to account by the news media and the congressional overseers, with consequent jeopardy to their bureaucratic careers. Regulators, therefore, are loath to approve uh, any good until it has undergone extremely exacting tests, which typically re require for drugs more than 10 years to complete. Other countries often allow the marketing of new drugs long before the FDA approves their sale in the United States. In contrast, if people uh, suffer preventable harm, e even if the suffering is extensive and lethal, while a medical good undergoes an extended period of mandatory testing, the regulators are unlikely to be identified by the media as responsible for the suffering, and many people will be unaware that a potentially beneficial good is being kept from the market. It follows that the number, stringency, and expense of the required tests, all of which are correlated with the duration of the test period, exceed the levels preferred by many consumers who consider the prohibition risk as well as the use risk. And notice that consumers who prefer more information than the government requires are not affected by this. They can voluntarily wait until enough additional information has been adduced to satisfy them. No one forces them to use a product just because the FDA has approved it. However, making the good available to those already willing and to risk its use hastens the day when sufficient information will become available to allay the doubts of those currently unwilling to bear the risk. Because the most important experience in assessing safety and efficacy of a drug is its widespread use. In sum, the regulators systematically impose requirements for marketing approval that lengthen the test period beyond that at which uh, at least some consumers prefer. When the government has the power to approve or disapprove of marketing a medical good, political jockeying comes into play to, to resolve people's differences of belief and, and risk evaluation. Those who prefer to use a good immediately uh, cannot express their preferences by means of market bidding. They, they have to resort to politics. Hence, afflicted citizens testify before congressional committees uh, in very heart-rending ways, and disease victims sometimes demonstrate in the streets, as, as many AIDS uh, sufferers did in the 1990s, uh, when the FDA was withholding uh, possibly beneficial drugs from their use. While political action committees and executives of drug and medical uh, device companies make huge campaign contributions to office seekers, none of this would occur if the benefits, costs, and risks of medical goods were allocated in a market process. Under the current regulatory regime, heavy fixed costs must be borne uh, by producers to gain FDA approval for marketing their products. The effect is to penalize disproportionately uh, both small companies and projects to develop uh, products with a relatively small markets, so-called orphan drugs, for example, uh, abandoned by developers because their expected revenues are too small to justify the costs and delays the FDA uh, requires. This is especially unfortunate because small companies are often uh, the most innovative companies. Many medical goods return attractive profits only because of their patent protection. When longer delays separate the granting of the patent from the FDA's marketing approval, the present value of the real in net income expected from the investment in research and development is diminished, and the R&D effort correspondingly discouraged. When R&D is reduced, as it has been especially by the 1962 amendments to the Federal drug laws, consumers are denied the benefits of improved and, in many cases, safer products. The longer the elapsed time before producers receive, uh, before products receive widespread use, the more delay occurs, uh, the, the more reliable estimates of potential risk are delayed, which can be established only with high confidence in large samples. Ironically, the FDA's regulation may increase not only the prohibition risk, in the short term, but also the use risk in the longer term. 
Now, let's look at how a market process would operate in contrast to everything I've been describing here. Much of the public's approval of government regulation of medical goods springs from a failure to understand how private institutions would operate uh, in uh, the absence of such regulation. Many people fear that without the government's watchdogs, the consumers would be deluged with uh, harmful goods and unable to identify fake procedures and quack medicines. This unsavory vision of the unregulated market process owes more to progressive ideology than it does to sound theory or history. Even in today's heavily regulated uh, context, private sources of research, products, information, and advice uh, do vastly more than the government to remedy the public's ills. Absent the regulation, these sources would flourish even more. And I want to emphasize this because very often when, when libertarians uh, try to convince somebody that a market process would, 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 would work better to provide some desirable service such as uh, quality assurance uh, than the government does, uh, People say, oh, you're just, you're just dreaming of some utopia that, that can't exist. You imagine that this would happen in a market, but, but it's, all, it's all in your mind. But what actually happens in this case, and, and in a great many others, is whenever people do value quality assurance, they're willing to pay for it, and notwithstanding the existence or non-existence of regulation, they go out and buy it, and suppliers appear. And in, in the case of, of drugs and medical devices, many suppliers of information and quality assurance have come forth over the years because people who use these products want that. They value that, and they're willing to pay for it. So the FDA exists, but it's really not the, not the source of the quality assurance that people are getting before they purchase these products and use them. The source lies elsewhere, almost completely. The whole FDA myth of their protecting the public is nothing but a myth, and a vicious myth. There is no need for government to assure the safety or efficacy of medical goods. People who are concerned about such matters can look to any number of private sources, and they will readily pay for the sorts of information they actually value as opposed to the kind of information used only to justify depriving people of the right to make their own decisions about their own health. Medical and ph pharmacy associations, for example, might reinstitute certification schemes for drugs and devices like the Seal of Approval Acceptance Program operated by the American Medical Association from 1929 to 1955. Notice this is a typical case of, of uh, crowding out. The government comes in and purports to do something, and so pr private suppliers are, are, are subject to a loss of demand for their services, and, and they may go out of business as a result. So what is really valuable disappears, and what is entirely specious replaces it. Private information services, such as the medical letter on drugs and, and therapeutics, uh, drug device alerts, Clinica, uh, which is called the World Medical Device and Diagnostic News, Journal of Emergency Medical Services, MD Byline, there are countless publications of this sort already circulate widely uh, and, and would be greatly expanded, uh, could be. Private organizations such as the Consumers Union, the publisher of Consumer Reports, and the Con Consumer Federation of America could do much to inform the public regarding medical goods. The American Association of Retired Persons might, uh, might redirect some of its activities from lobbying to advising the elderly about medical goods. Manufacturers themselves, if legally free to do so, would have a strong incentive to provide information about potentially harmful or ineffective goods offered by rivals. There's competition in every other aspect of products. There could be Competition among firms with re regard to quality assurance, and there certainly would be if they could undertake that kind of competition. Of course, they're not permitted to do that by, by current law. Trade associations could establish and police standards. Quality could be certified by an organization such as Underwriters Laboratory, which is a, a private organization that has for a long time tested electrical appliances uh, to ensure they meet strict standards. 
Insurance companies with uh, policies covering manufacturers for product liability judgments could play a much stronger role in the absence of the FDA. Uh, I'd like to suggest something to you. Uh, you all have computers, I'm sure, and at uh, some time when you ha have a few minutes, uh, search the following acronym, ECRI, ECRI. This is an acronym for an organization that's uh, located north of Philadelphia. It was previously called Emergency Care Research Institute. No longer uses that title and just goes by the acronym. But ECRI is an amazing organization. It's totally uh, separate from government in any way, and it's totally separate from industry in any way. Uh, that is to say, it doesn't receive industry support for any of its activities. It does charge for some of its information when it sells information to clients. But ECRI is an organization that if, if you are uh, involved in any hospital or clinic or anything where medical devices are used and you're considering purchasing a new one, or you have a problem with an existing one and you, you need to find out how to fix it or what's wrong with it. Uh, people go to ECR, ECRI right away because they have an enormous laboratory with all kinds of, of technicians and scientists and they're neutral. All, the, all they're there to do is, is give you information that will help you make these products work properly. And for that reason, people rely on on this organization. And if you're not in this business, chances are very slender that you've ever heard of ECRI. But such organizations are quite common throughout the economy. <laughs> There's people value information, they're willing to pay for it, and so suppliers can maintain themselves as a result of serving such clients. We don't need the government to provide any information and to rely on it to provide information is to place your very life at risk. In any event, manufacturers have a strong incentive to maintain high quality in order to avoid the large penalties assessed by the courts in tort cases. At present, many such private activities, although by no means all, have in effect been crowded out by the operations of government agencies. The activities uh, uh, of government agencies necessarily reflect the wishes of the political masters, and the FDA is no exception, whereas the activities of private firms reflect the valuations of consumers, and only the consumer knows what risks are worth taking. No one knows better than the manufacturer the nature of the goods offered for sale. Private third Third-party providers of information or advice must supply worthwhile services if they are to survive in competition in an open market. Disgruntled consumers lacking an appeal to Congress or, or a federal bureau will, will simply resort to competing sellers. Specialized providers of information as well as the suppliers of medical goods themselves will engage in rivalry for consumers' business. In a market process, feedback from consumers drives the outcome. In a political process, the actions of organized special interest groups and wealthy politically connected individuals determine the course of events. It's ironic that the same people who appreciate that the government does a poor job of maintaining the streets or delivering the mail, nonetheless support placing powers of life and death in the hands of the same politicians and bureaucrats who bungle far less important tasks. So, to conclude, the two most important questions in any economic analysis are, one, what is the alternative? And two, what happens then, and then, and then? Unless one has carefully considered the free market alternative, one is not justified in concluding, as most mainstream economists have, that government regulation of medical goods, including uh, marketing conditions and, and marketing certification, only after rigidly structured, very expensive and time-consuming tests, improves consumer welfare. Of course, such regulation does d diminish use risk, uh, indeed by prohibiting all medical goods entirely. 
use risk, at least legal use risk, could be wholly eliminated. Okay? We'll save your life. We won't let you get any of these goods that might hurt you. Okay? And let's extend that while we're at it to automobiles. We'll wipe out all automobile accidents by outlawing automobiles and so forth. Okay? No more use risk, my lady. A moment's reflection on that absurd extreme makes plain what is wrong with emphasizing use risk and ignoring prohibition risk. Whatever means one finds, finds preferable for allocating the risk, the an analysis is incomplete until one inquires into the ensuing consequences. Not only the immediate ones, but the increasingly remote ones likely to flow from the chosen institutional arrangements. Government regulation inevitably leads to politicization and its evolution reflects the shifting distribution of political power. Market processes permit consumer preferences to drive the allocation of inputs, outputs, and risks. And over time, one can expect government regulation to feed on itself and ratchet upward with each notorious medical tragedy. And over time, one can expect the market process to respond to consumer feedback via the price system and to encourage the types of product innovation information transmission actually valued by consumers. Of course, the market process will not produce nirvana. Don't get me wrong. There's real risk associated with many aspects of life, virtually all aspects of life, in fact, and as particularly with the kinds of products I've been discussing this morning. There is real risk. It cannot be wished away. Uh, so the market process will not produce nirvana. Uh, whether market agencies certify products or the FDA certifies products, some approved products will turn out to cause harm. It's in their very nature. Risk cannot be banished inescapably within the limits set by technical, institutional and human constraints, these risks must be borne. Even in a free market, regrettable choices will sometimes be made, and tragic events will sometimes occur. But apart from the more promising long-term developments one may realistically expect from a market process, one must ultimately face up to the moral dimensions of the issue. As the health scientist Samuel Broder has said, it's not good for people to be put in a situation where they're begging for their lives from a central government authority. Okay, I want to show you one little schema that I, uh, I used in, uh, in the book I mentioned earlier. This is a, a quick way to summarize how this, this tragic situation I've been describing came to be. Uh, oh, well, I won't try to master the machine instantly here. I hope you can see a little bit of this. Uh, if you look at, the, at the, uh, the, the, the lines that are sort of made up of three individual lines, what we have there is the kind of uh, regulatory setup that occurs during normal periods. Okay? There's nothing special going on. There's no big uh, scandal or tragedy in the news and what have you. And what we've got there is uh, the iron triangles, uh, which we always find when we discuss regulatory matters, the, the combination of the congressional committees with oversight responsibility, the FDA, and the interest groups uh, that have a stake in what's going on here. And of course, they play back and forth with the news media. Everybody tries to put his spin on, uh, on matters. And uh, the, the combination of what's going on in the news and, uh, and the operation of the, uh, um, someone who knows the machine. Good, thank you, Walter. The, these all put, <laughs> These all put pressure on the FDA, and, and generally the direction the pressure put on is, is for uh, an, ex an expansion and, and an increase in the detail of FDA regulations. So we get that outcome, and the upshot at the bottom there is a diminished scope uh, of individual action 
uh, for patients and, and doctors and other providers of medical goods and services. So this is normally how the system is operating. So say, say today, this is what's going on right now. Uh, now, occasionally, something happens. Okay? There's, a, there's a big uh, uh, news item, like the sulfonilamide deaths back in the 1930s, or, or the discovery that thalidomide is giving rise to, to a lot of, uh, uh, of deformed babies being born without arms or legs or other, uh, other terrible deformities. So, so some, something happens, and, and, and of course the, 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 the news media love these things. They, they, they thrive on things of this sort. So they, the, as if they weren't bad enough in their own right, they, they blow them up e e even more, and they discuss them for weeks on end. And, and that shocking revelation you know, gets a lot of people aware of something, and and gives them a storyline about why something happened as it did. And of course, you, you, you know how the media tends to explain things. Uh, and so there's always public clamor as a result. And that public clamor is, uh, is certainly felt by the people at the FDA, you know, because the first thing they worry about is that, you know, are we going to be blamed? That's their number one concern always. And the second is, how, how can we exploit this crisis to our benefit? That's what every government official or agency thinks in the face of any crisis, real or, or imaginary. How can we exploit this to seize more power, privilege, and money? So the FDA is a master at playing this game, and so they will use this clamor for, to make major increases, to push out the envelope that contains the, the regulation they're now uh, carrying out. And again, the result is a kind of leap, a, a ratchet, if you like. Uh, I've talked about ratchets in relation to wars and uh, the overall power of government. Here's one that doesn't involve war at all, but it operates similarly. Normal growth of government, you know, the outside lines, the normal process, and then shock, crisis, upward, uh, abrupt increase in the power of the government, retained. Crisis passes, new powers retained. In this case, almost n no power ever surrendered. So that's how we get to this situation with, with many volumes of federal law required just to contain the part that applies to uh, the powers of the Food and Drug Administration. So I, I hope this has given you some new uh, thoughts about uh, this area of economic and governmental life, and, and I hope, too, that, uh, that you're, you're stirred by it. This is, this is a horrible situation. Uh, people are dying every day as a result of this, and not a few, many. And so if you ever have an opportunity to speak against it, I hope you will. Thank you very much.